Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Thanks for watching. Today's topic is Wrestlelist Remarkable Books number eight. Our first book today is All Things Bright and Beautiful by James Harriet, published in 1974. That's the uh, also the the title is also the first line in a wonderful Angl Anglican hymn. You may have you might be familiar that with that hymn with that line from church. Anyway, this is a wonderful story. It's about the author was a, a veterinarian, a farm veterinarian in England, and so he would take care of horses and cows, goats, sheep, pigs, chickens, and so forth. And uh, and this is about his experiences, and it's it's very nice, it's very touching, and uh, there's a lot of humor, you know. And, and every situation he's in is different. He has these challenges because uh, he's dealing with different different animals and trying to treat them. So there, it's a very nice, very nice book. Okay, the next book is All Creatures Great and Small, also by James Harriet, published in 1972. Now this is the second line of that Anglican hymn. And it's more, this is actually the first book that he wrote. And you know, he, it's, it's a, these are nice stories that he, of his work and, and treating these different animals. And uh, it's, it's very touching, he did, he did a really, the writing is good, and it's all true, true stories of his experiences. And people, I think these, these are very po were very popular books. You know, people enjoyed reading them because he, he's a good guy, you know, he, and he had funny things would happen to him as he's trying to treat these animals. It was all very interesting, and, uh, and he would meet the farmers, talk with them, and, you know, of course, you have to go into the stables and to treat the animals, and he'd have to make house calls, right, because these are big animals, treating horses and so forth. And uh, pretty challenging work, but, you know, and also interesting and enjoyable. The next book is All Things Wise and Wonderful, by, again by James Harriet, published in 1977. And again, that's the, that's the third line in this Anglican hymn, which he, you know, he wrote for these first four books. He, he took lines from, he, he basically is uh, telling that Anglican hymn, at least the first stanza which actually is a very nice hymn. Now, one thing I remember from these books is he came to treat, some, I think, think they were cows who were very sick, and uh, he had a medi medicine for them, and he gave, gave them, uh, some of them, he gave them way too much, and he thought, oh my God, he felt like, you know, they were going to all die because of, of too much med medication, medicine. Uh, but uh, as it turns out, those were the only cows that survived. The rest all died, and, and they were... And he believed the others died because of pain. They just couldn't take the pain anymore, and they died. Now, the, the cows he gave too much medicine to, they all slept for like two days. And he believed the fact, the fact that they were allowed to sleep really uh, helped them to recover because at, while they were asleep, they didn't feel any pain. So that's kind of interesting, you know, in life. when we can, If we're going through hard, real hard times, it's, you know, sleep is wonderful. It can be very... If you're, if you're feeling really, really terrible, sometimes the best thing you can do is if you can take a nap and, and sleep, and you'll feel better. And like they say, sleep on it. Okay, the next book is The Lord God Made Them All. So that's the last uh, line in that stanza. And this is, again, by James Harriet, published in 1981. More stories of his experiences on farms in his part of England with these different farm animals and the, uh, the farmers that he met and these experiences that he had and trying, you know, trying to, you know, gain the trust of the animals so he could treat them. And, you know, animals, you have different kinds of animals. And of course, animals have different uh, personalities. You know, they're not all the same. And uh, he also had to help, he was involved with helping to give birth, which was important, you know, to make sure that the, the mother would survive and, and the offspring as well. So the James Harriet, he just he's a very beloved author in England and, and around the world. He did a really good job, and it's all true, his, his experiences of his life as a farm veterinarian. Okay, the next book is Growing Up by Russell Baker, published in 1989. Russell Baker became a popular newspaper man, I believe a columnist, and uh, I read this book because he's the same generation as my father. He grew up in the 1920s and 1930s, and I kind of wanted to get to know better my, my father's growing up, you know, what, what it was like. And, of course, the 1920s were called the Roaring Twenties with Prohibition, you know, alcohol being was, was prohibited, and then there was people were still drinking. 
and it kind of promoted crime. So you had the gangsters, Al Capone and, and Pretty Boy Floyd, Ma Barker, John Dillinger, uh, Babyface Nelson, and so forth, Bonnie and Clyde. And, and that went on into the 30s, the Depression, and Franklin D. Roosevelt, and the famous baseball players, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and the New York Yankees, and Joe Lewis, the heavyweight boxer. So this is, this is, he's, uh, he's a good writer, and he's just writing about his childhood. He, he had an uncle who was, uh, I think, unemployed and depressed and who was, I think, reading uh, Thomas Jefferson, something like that. That kind of caught my attention. Okay, the next book is Roots by Alex Haley, published in 1976. Yeah, this was a very influential book, and they made a TV miniseries, which was extremely popular. And uh, Alex Haley was, is an African-American, and he decided to research his family, going all the way back to Africa. And he worked real hard, and he finally he found that he had this ancestor named Kunta Kinte, who was from West Africa. And so he learned everything he could about his, his family and his ancestors going back to Africa. And he wrote this book about, about them. You know, Kunta Kinte being uh, taken, uh, captured and taken into slavery, brought to America. And then the, next, the, the subsequent generations in his family. And uh, up to the present. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. And he, he went back to Africa and found the village where this Kunta Kinte had, had lived and was taken from. And the people were very touched that he made that effort to come. And Because, uh, see, Africans knew that millions of their people had been taken away, and they, they never saw them again. And so it was tragic for, very tragic for them, the tragedy for the African-American slaves, and, and then also for Africans. And then the, when Alex Haley came and he, they found out who he was, they started singing this song, one came back, one came back. That and there, it was a wonderful reunion when he came to see his, to see the people from this uh, village where his ancestor had come from, and it was this was kind of part of the civil rights movement. It helped African Americans feel proud and have a better sense of identity of who they were and their background. And uh, okay, so the next book is *The Mosquito Coast* by Paul Thoreau, published in 1981. This is a fine novel. It's about a, about a man in the U.S. who has a family, and he gets fed up with modern life, all the, all the buying and buying, and, you know, the consumer culture and, um, and city life and so forth. And see, he decides he wants to live a natural life, a, a simple life. He moves his family, his wife and children, to, uh, to Central America, to Honduras, the, the Mosquito Coast, named after the Mosquito Indians. And he... Uh, he wants to find. He's looking for happiness in in a different in a bet in a different environment. You know, more more natural. And of course, it's it's, it's it is very different. It's it's tropical. It's hot, and a different culture. There's a lot of disease and mosquitoes and rain and and it becomes a disaster. Actually, this whole experience. So the, they made a movie with Harrison Ford. I haven't seen, but uh, I thought the the book was wonderful. I I keep mispronouncing his name, Paul Thoreau. It's Paul Thoreau. My friend Bob Kinsey used to correct me on that. Okay, the next book is Bonfire of the Vanities by Tom Wolfe, published in 1987. Tom Wolfe is a fine writer, and this is a, this is a, a wonderful book. It's a novel set in New York City, and it's about, there's this character. When they made, they made the movie, Tom Hanks played this character who's a, a rich man who, he, he's out driving, and uh, some African-American fellows to hold up the car, or he believes they, they're going to hold up his car, and they're, you know, they're going to rob him, and he, he drives the car quickly. He ends up hitting one of them, and he, I think he killed one of the guys, so, and eventually it comes out that he killed a guy with, he, he, and, and it's hit and run. He, he left, of course, he was afraid also, and he ends up getting arrested, going to prison, or at least to jail until his trial, and they have the trial, and his his defense and how his in his family's uh, he kind of his friends kind of shy away from him and they have the the, the African American politician who kind of uses this as, as for political purposes, you know that this rich white guy here he killed a poor a black guy and uh, it's it's a good story you know it's a very very interesting story he, he did a really good job. Okay, so the next book is Dukakis, the man who would be president, by Richard Gaines. And Michael Sig Siegel, published in 1988. 
This is about Michael Dukakis, who ran for president of the United States in 1988 and won the uh, nomination of the Democratic Party. And that's why this book came out, kind of promoting him. And uh, he lost in the general election against George uh, Bush Sr. I supported Dukakis in 1988. I was a big liberal and uh, strong Democrat. And I, I worked at the Democratic Party office in Cleveland calling people to vote for Democrats and uh, Michael Dukakis. And I met at that time, right before the, on the election night, I believe I met uh, three famous men, powerful men, Howard Metzimum, U.S. Senator, Dick Celeste, Governor of Ohio, and Andrew Young, who was U.N. Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and the Mayor of Atlanta. Anyway, Dukakis lost, and he was a good guy, kind of kind of dull, uh, very hardworking, good man, and uh, he was a Greek American. A lot of Greek Americans contributed to his campaign, although they were gener they are generally conservative Republicans. So it was said that they didn't want to know what he, what his platform was because they knew they wouldn't agree with it. But they'd be happy if a Greek American became president. So Michael Dukakis, he was a good guy. They used to show him, um, you know, he'd be flying around the country from campaign stop to campaign stop, and he'd be on the outside the airplane playing catch. You know, with a baseball glove and a baseball with somebody, and that was, that was pretty cool to get to get a little exercise. Michael Dukakis. Okay, the next book is The Jungles of New Guinea by Edwin Hoyt, published in 1989. This is about the fighting in the Second World War on the island of New Guinea, which is an island which has always fascinated me. You know, it's this huge island, one of the largest islands in the world, and it's divided. The western part is part of Indonesia. The eastern part is Papua New Guinea, and it was a British colony, and uh, also, well, Australian-influenced. And in the war, the Japanese invaded from the north in New Guinea, and Australian, British, and American forces came from the south, and there was a lot of fighting in the mountains <coughs> of New Guinea, and very tough conditions. You know, the, uh, the people were like a... The people of New, the local people were a Stone Age people. They didn't even know they didn't have metal until the 20th century. Um, so a very interesting culture, and then this uh, fighting in the mountains, very hot and humid, and uh, rains and mud, a lot of insects and uh, snakes and disease. Very tough conditions that the that the Japanese there went through, and the Australians, British, and Americans, and, and Canadians uh, who fought in New Guinea. And it, this book talks about Douglas MacArthur, who was the American general. He was very much a part of this and who was controversial, had been in the Philippines many years, and pretty strong-willed, but kind of an arrogant guy. So, okay, the next book is The Elements of Style by William Strunk, Jr. and E.B. White, published in 1935. I read this book because it was my sister Pamela's, and I had found it at home with her name inscribed in it. And it's a short book, and it's, it's a book for writers. If you want to write, if you if you write and want to improve your writing, this is a book you can read. And uh, I read it too fast, so I, I can't remember much about it. But um, it's uh, definitely, yeah, this is one of the books you should read slowly. And I, I, I think it's, the uh, the ideas are timeless. So if, if you inter are interested in, in improving your writing, this would be a good book to read. Okay. The next book is Anne of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery, published in 1939. This is the sixth of the Anne of Green Gables books, and it's uh, Anne as a, she has, by this time, she has six children, and uh, they're growing up, and her, she and her husband, Gilbert Blythe, it's about their life, and it's about their ch her, her six children, and how they're, you know, what they're going through, and this, these types of books remind me of the Waltons, the uh, famous, uh, uh, TV show back in the 70s, which was very, you know, very wholesome about this, again, a big family in a rural area, and back, you know, many years ago when, when our country was, you know, the old days, and uh, so actually, when I read this, I thought it was the last of the Anne books, but there are two, there are two more after, after Anne of Ingleside. The next book is Vida by Richard Deming, published in 1972. It's about Vida Blue, who was a Major League Baseball pitcher in the 1970s into the 80s, and he was a star pitcher, starting pitcher for the Oakland A's, 
who won three World Series, 1972, 73, and 74. So it's an interesting, that was, a, that was an amazing team, you know, about those, all those guys, Reggie Jackson and, and Bill, Bill North, Burt Campanaris, Joe Rudy, uh, Gene Tennis, Ray Fossey, Dick Green, Sal Bando, uh, and the manager, uh, uh, manager uh, Dick Williams, the owner, Charlie Finley, and they had these, uh, they were the first team to have colorful uniforms, these yellow and green uniforms, and they wore white shoes, and they, and they wore, all had mustaches, so they, they were a very interesting team, and they won three World Series, and Vita Blue was, played a very important uh, part of that. He was one of their, t- their top starting pitchers, along with Catfish Hunter and Ken Holtzman, and of course Raleigh Fingers, the great relief pitcher. Okay, the next book is The Temple of My Familiar by Alice Walker, published in 1989. And this is a this is a strange book, very interesting, very powerful, and she's uh, promoting the idea that in prehistory, men and women lived in separate communities in Africa, and the women were priestesses because of their childbirthing ability. Uh, so Alice Walker, a wonderful uh, novelist, African American woman who uh, you know promotes. Uh, promotes them, promotes African women and African American women. And, you know, we've lived in the 20th century was a, a century where European and European American men were very powerful. You know, what we call white men, but they really are, you'd say, to be more precise, European descent. And they're very powerful. Now, here you have this woman. She's an African American woman, but she she wrote wonderful books. She, and she's a very influential, and I, I highly recommend the books of Alice Walker. Okay. The next book is The War of the Innocents by Charles Flood, published in 1970. This is a book written by a reporter who spent a year uh, in in the Vietnam War describing what he saw. I read the book because uh, on the back it has a recommendation by John Updike. And again, this is a this is nonfiction. He's telling it like it is, you know, what was going on in that very tough situation. And it seemed like we it was a noble cause. We were trying to to stop communism, which is a, which is a very uh, attractive and powerful and seductive but destructive type of government, where they really take away all the freedom people have and they eliminate religion. It all sounds good because it's especially for the poor people, but uh, I believe we we did uh, we were fighting a noble cause and we lost because it was a very tough fight again because communism is so attractive. And uh, it, the people who be, get into it become such strong believers in it. And it takes many, many years before they finally become disillusioned with, with communism. Okay, the next book is Snake by Ken Stabler and Barry Stainback, published in 1986. Uh, Ken Stabler was a, an NFL quarterback in the 1970s. He played mostly for the Oakland Raiders, and I think he won a couple Super Bowls, at least one. He was a left-handed quarterback, and you know he was a star in the 1970s. So I remember him when he played, and uh, so this is about the NFL of that time, you know, with the the different, different the different players, and he talks a lot about partying, and you know the other players of that time, Terry Bradshaw and Roger Staubach, and and so forth. So, and he was talking about hoping to get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I think he died young, uh, and yeah, he was he was too there was he was too much doing too much drinking. And, uh, and, uh, and, and there was some, I believe, some drug use. So anyway, Ken Stabler, an amazing quarterback in the 1970s. Okay, the next book is I Never Played the Game by Howard Cosell and Peter Von, von Venter, published in 1985. Howard Cosell was an amazing guy back in the 70s. Um, he was one of the three fellows on Monday Night Football at the beginning in 1970 with uh, Don Meredith and uh, Frank Gifford. That was, and that became an extremely popular, you know, NFL game every Monday night. And Cosell was this uh, New York Jewish guy, real smart. You'd use a lot of vocabulary words that people un- didn't understand, very opinionated. And, uh, and he had this very unique, I'm Coward Cosell and this is Monday Night Football. He had a very, that's not a good impersonation of Cosell. He was very entertaining. He was the guy people loved to hate. And they had a great thing going with Frank Gifford, who was sort of the straight man who'd been a star. He would call the game. You know, you're watching, it's a game's going on. And Don Meredith was would joke around. He was the funny cowboy. And, 
And so it was, it was very good, very entertaining. And uh, uh, um, Cosell also was involved with Muhammad Ali and interviewing him a lot. Ali was the great heavyweight boxer in the 70s, and, and Cosell interviewed him, him a lot and, and, and also announced his games or, you know, would, would, br- would describe the, 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 I mean, the, the fights, the boxing matches that Cosell was involved in. He also got into Major League Baseball. Cosell announced on TV the death of John Lennon during a Monday night football game. So uh, that was historical, I think, in 1980. The sad thing about Cosell, he was he was so uh, popular and famous, did very, very well, uh, but he be- it was pride that really destroyed him. He became very arrogant, and he became a mean guy, and it really ruined, ruined his career and his life. So that's kind of a warning. But he certainly was a very entertaining fellow back in the 70s when uh, television and sports became a really big thing in America. The next book is The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, published in 1890. Now, my father used to tell stories when he was, or the story, when he was 14 years old. On October 30th, 1938, when my dad was 14, they had a radio broadcast called The War of the Worlds, which was based on the book, and it's about an, a Martian invasion of the, of the Earth. Martians are invading. And people at the time thought it was real. They panicked. There was all this, people got in their cars. People were trying to get away from cities where they thought it would be dangerous. And uh, they kept interrupting the broadcast to say, this is, it's not true. It's just a story. It's just entertainment. But people didn't believe it. Yeah, so this was a very dramatic moment in American history in 1938, so I wanted to read the book because my father was such a strong memory because he was listening to the broadcast and thought it was true, thought it was real. Um, so anyway, that's The War of the Worlds. Okay, the next book is The Hidden Flower by Pearl Buck, published in 1952. Now, the, after the Second World War, the United States had a military occupation of Japan that went on for a number of years, and a number of American men... Uh, fell in love with Japanese women and established relationships. You know, the, once the war ended, we found out the Japanese were a very nice people. During the war, there was, there was a sense they were very cruel, and actually they, they had been during the war. But once the war was over, there, was no, there were no problems with the Japanese at all. Very peaceful, hardworking, good people, and, uh, yeah, and very nice people. And so, but anyway, the problem with this story is that, you know, the times, America was still a pretty racist country, and... This fellow, he wanted to marry a Japanese woman, and uh, but his family was against it, and her family was against it, and uh, they had a child which ended up being adopted by a, a, a Jewish German uh, older woman, so at least, who who was a ver- became a very good mother. But it shows just shows how hard it was having interracial marriages at that time. My wife is from the Philippines, so I'm so glad to be living now where there's so much more, more tolerance and acceptance and respect for interracial marriages or intercultural marriages. And because uh, at that time it was it was very tough. You know, you'd have people people wouldn't accept it. And so this is kind of this is a tragic this is a tragic story. The next book is Maud: The Life of L. M. Montgomery by Harry Bruce, published in 1992. And so this is the story of, of the woman who created Anne of Green Gables, and uh, which is interesting to learn about her, Maud Montgomery, and she, she'd had a tough life. And I, she, you know, she got into writing to make a living. She was you know, a modern woman way back when, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, self-supporting and independent. And, of course, she did very, very well. But, uh, and these books are... They're kind of idyllic, although there are problems in the books, but she had a very tough childhood, and in a sense, and a tough early life, and in a sense, uh, Anne was kind of a fantasy girl that she created, and she did very well. You know, these books are are wonderful books, but this is the, the story of the author, the creator of Anne of Green Gables. Okay, the next book is The Graduate by Charles Webb, published in 1963. And they made the famous movie with Dustin Hoffman. This book is a, it's short, easy to read. It's about a, a college graduate. And, you know, he finishes college, comes home, doesn't know what he has, no idea what he's going to do. <laughs> so he, they have a swimming pool. He, he lays in the pool and his parents keep asking him what he's going to do. And he doesn't know because he's, he's, he's confused. And it, it is tough when you finish college. I, I felt the same way. When I finished college, I had no idea what I was going to do after college. And uh, 
it's a big adjustment. And one one of the character one of the characters in the story is a, a friend of his father who tells him plastics plastics is the future. You know <laughs> that he should get into plastics and. He has a relationship with an older woman. That's part of it. It's, it's a nice story. It's, it's a great movie. Okay, the next book is Every Living Thing by James Harriet, published in 1992. Again, this is more of the same of these stories of a, a, farm, a farm veterinarian in, in England, you know, treating horses and cows and picking chickens, the, the various animals on a, on a farm. And uh, he did a... It's really nice. It's you know, it's fun. They're, they're funny things that he goes through, and he these farmers he you know he meets with and trying to treat the animals, which you know isn't that easy. You know, treating a sick a sick farm animal, but that's his job, and he has to travel all over to these different places. And the weather you know might be very cold, and he has to go in the barn and and try to try to get gain the trust of the of the sick animals, which you know, very often it was a very tough thing to do. Wonderful book. The next book is Postcards from the Edge by Carrie Fisher, published in 1987. Carrie Fisher was uh, Princess uh, Leia from Star, Star Wars. And, uh, you know, and so this is about her life. She, was, uh, she grew up in Hollywood. Her mother was, I believe, Debbie Reynolds. So, and she herself became a famous actress. You know, and, uh, but she all, this is a book about you know, life in Hollywood. And she developed a, a drug and alcohol problem, and she goes into rehab. And I believe that shortened her life. So this is a book about about you know the about recovery from drug drug addiction and alcoholism, and it's also with her relationship with her mother. And uh, in the movie, her mother play is played by Shirley MacLaine, and then she's played by Meryl Streep. It's a very very fine fine movie and a really good book. It's it's a this is a true story. It's about sort of the empty life that she had in Hollywood. You know, being even though she was uh, wealthy and famous, you know, still she wasn't very she wasn't happy. It was empty. That's why she got into drugs and alcohol. And uh, so until she finally uh, found re- found recovery through a through Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, the next book is If I Die in a Combat Zone: Box Me Up and Ship Me Home by Tim O'Brien, published in 1969. Uh, this is about a Vietnam uh, soldier who comes home from the war and about about his experiences after he gets home, and um, it's it's a poetic book. You know these guys they they would go off and have this horrendous experience and come back to their hometown and the people there, you know, they're just living their lives. Nothing had changed with them, just living sort of normal routine lives. And these guys, it's it's you know it was it was tough on them. And he has a great line. He wrote, "Quote in return for all your terror." The prairies stretch out, arrogantly unchanged. He came home to Minnesota. The prairies would be the flatlands of America. And so, yeah, they'd come home. And the thing is, in the, he, they'd kind of expected the people at home to, you know, to really understand what, they'd been, what the guys had been through in Vietnam. And they didn't. They didn't. And so they, they'd have a, it was a tough adjustment coming home and, because people couldn't understand them and that you know they were traumatized what they'd been through in the war all the death they had seen and so forth and okay so anyway the book next book is all under heaven by pearl s buck published in 1973 this is about a story set in china near the end of the chinese civil war the uh, the family the the father is american the mother is russian and they have chinese born children they have to get out of china because things are getting pretty bad and there's a great line here where she writes, uh, Parents must choose telling their children to deny the truth, to save their skins, or speak the truth when the cost might be death, the whole agony of parenthood. So this is a novel about these missionaries in China, you know, right before the end of the Chinese Civil War. They had to get out because the communists were taking over. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.